Alphonse's continued issues and challenges for the mobile health in future, especially with the focus on emerging economies like India, China, and Africa. So, what issues I'm going to address today? Those include mobile and value added services, then consumer issues related to all these kinds of services, and the challenges for the future which we may like a face for converting it to mobile health. So, what is India as a market for telecom and communication companies? Today it's the fastest growing economy in the world, as you all know, and like a, it's the largest telecommunication network in the world, the second largest in terms of number of wireless connections, and it's uh, said like uh, in the next 5 to 10 years it's going to be the biggest. It has around 500 million, million mobile phone connection and the types of services those are provided in India like vary a lot. Like some providers do use GSM technology, some of them use CDMA, some of them have WLM. I guess that's uh, totally new for somebody who's from US because that's like a wireless in local loop. That's uh, new for me. And uh, fixed lines obviously, landline phones. So like a uh, Plus, there is a whole amount of diversity in case of operators which provide the services. Almost like a 15 or more amount of operators who provide the services. So, the biggest operator you can say in terms of a consumer base is Airtel, which holds around like 21% of the total market share. And today, like they are expanding a lot into mid Africa and like China. So, other big uh, products <coughs> are Reliance Telecom, then Tata, as you must they just acquired Jaguar and Land Rover. Then other European companies like Vodafone, then maybe like ASL Blue. So how about the internet service? I mean, internet service is a part and like a very important because that's how we get the information services to our <coughs> devices. So, so, so the subscriber base for the internet in India is pretty low as compared to any country in the world. It's just 30.54 million. I mean, that's the number, but you can say like uh, when I took the internet connection for myself in India, like a year or two back, it took me around like six months to get the connections. I mean, after even getting the connection sanctioned from the telephone company, it took me around like one to like 1.5 months to get the connection at home and get the connection running. There is no manpower, there are no skilled people who can execute the systems. So, like, uh, we have a TRAI, that's Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, which has defined, like, uh, the basic kind of connection or basic kind of broadband connection which you should, which a telephone company or communication company should provide to any <coughs> consumer should be around 256 kilobyte per second or higher. But uh, if you actually see the connections, it's around like 30 to 40 kb that they keep. So, so it's really pathetic kind of service they provide. And uh, if you look at the charges which they apply for broadband, it's like uh, they charge for unlimited download on this 256 kb so-called connection. They charge around 700 to 1000 bucks, 1000 Indian rupees. That's close to like uh, 20 US dollars per month. But I don't know, like if the twenty dollars is a big figure, but uh, in case if you like uh, compare it to the quality of the connection, I think it's too much that companies are mining from the consumer. So there is a third option, which is kind of a thing like a next generation network. Those are coming up. Uh, what the Indian government did is like uh, when the Indian era of Indian business was opening for global companies, what they did is like uh, they locked the period till 2010 for the companies, those are domestic in nature and domestic in the business, so that they can expand and like after 2010 the whole market will open and like all the global companies they can come in, in, in India and they can also do the business. So by now what the companies like Reliance, PSNL and Tata Teleservices have done, like they have established the big and huge kind of uh, optical fiber network in every and each kind of place in the India where you don't get even like a mobile connection or maybe like a mobile reception. So, 
value added services what is value added services it's basically which adds to the value of the service which your customer is getting through any kind of service provider and like uh, i guess the best example of value added services is this <laughs> for the IPL kind of thing. I mean, it's kind of a sh I mean, short version of the uh, full one-day cricket, you can say. Like, it's like 2020 cricket match that was played in South Africa. So like uh, now what Vodafone, I mean, that's the company which owns these ads. What they are using is like, because of the popularity of the campaign, they are using the same cartoon characters everywhere in the campaigns. And like, it's so popular, like, they are coming up with new ads every day. So this is what is value added services. Like you can just send SMS, you can just send MMS, you can share the pictures with your friend and like so many things you can do. You can just read news on your cell phone, you can watch movies, you can download music, you can just listen to the online radio. And around like uh, in 2007, the revenue that was generated from the, these kinds of value added services was around US dollar in 5 billion. I mean, in terms of Indian rupees, it's a huge thing because if you want to convert this, you will have to like multiply <coughs> with 50. That's like around like 251 billion rupees. And <coughs> so, like, uh, what kind of uh, value so added services are provided in India? So, like, basic service you can say as SMS, then IVR that's like an interactive video voice response. Uh, then we have VAP that was like used on like and like not so much widely used now because now people are getting better handsets. And Bollywood content and cricket content that's like uh, SMS alerts, ringtones, games, wallpapers, and maybe like movie clips. And the most important thing you can consider it rural application initiative like there are some applications those are been developed by some FMCG companies some uh, like uh, agribusiness companies those help farmers to like uh, understand the weather condition like and uh, like come to know about the thing like what is the trading rates those are going on currently in the market which is closest to you or the market which is like a some uh, like a maybe like 20 miles away like you can just go in that market and sell your stuff and get more money or maybe like uh, at which place you are getting cheap amount of like a uh, manure or like chemical fertilizer or like any additives you will need for your farming so this is kind of a tool that is developed by Nokia which like uh, helps farmers to like uh, read news read uh, like a uh, stuff that is related to farming like you can improve on your farming then you can even come to know about the weather conditions directly on your cell phone which is i mean most of people in the united states will have like probably something like blackberry or maybe some high kind of phone like android or like iphone but in india people don't have so high <coughs> high tech phones so like for simple phones you can use these kinds of tools then this is one company called idea they are the cellular providers they are also develop their kind of services for the people so like i guess this is the best kind of example of a mobile commerce it's like uh, airtel has uh, tied up with manchester united, united and like uh, they are like uh, got some share in the team and like uh, 
what you can do is if you are using Airtel services, you can just go onto their portal and download the wallpapers or like clips or maybe like something like own a jersey or something by like you're paying it to your Airtel services. So why do we need to focus on value-added services in India? It's because it's a booming economy, it has a huge amount of user base and subscribers and the <coughs> user population in India is very diverse as compared to any kind of country that is there, when you say United States or maybe China even. Diversity in India is too much than any other country. Then value-added services act as an informal <coughs> resource for the person, like if I'm roaming in some city where I don't know, I can just use my value-added service and come to like where I'm supposed to go, like what time the movie show is going to be. Then you can say like face using Facebook, MySpace account through your cell phone, that's social computing, then entertainment, banking and financial services, and like uh, various initiatives which I already mentioned. Uh, in case of banking and financial services, it's very primitive in terms of development in India because people are not like uh, hardly like uh, of the 100 people hardly like 12 to 13 people do own a debit card or credit card and like uh, people are not so much keen on using their credit cards and debit cards online so like uh, these kinds of services are very primitive and not so much widely used. So what telecom authority is doing for this? So they have come up with the value added services related policies which uh, contains uh, like a, a bunch of policies and regulations which should be applied to a re regulator who is providing these services. But what happens is like up to the definition of value-added services by TRAI, but which they have, what they say like value-added services is a extra kind of services. Those are provided by a provider or the cellular operator for the benefit of users. So it's not the thing like if the quality of value added service is not good, like, then you can just sue the cellular operator. It's not the only person who is giving the services, it's like the total value chain that is operating. So there is some problem in the quality of value added service, like 10 people in the, those value added chain need to be sued, I mean, that cannot happen. So like, by this time they are like very safe. Then they even brought a uh, consultation paper on a value added services. Um, from a outside consultant, which had many like a uh, suggestion like uh, uh, making the security of your information, making the security of the consumer data as a priority, then uh, making mobile wallet for uh, like uh, facilitating payments across the networks, like uh, where you can like uh, transfer your <coughs> kind of money or your like uh, your prepaid amount to somebody else prepaid account um, like uh, I just forgot to mention one thing like uh, in India the more amount of users what they use is like a prepaid kind of connection I mean although like there are significant amount of people who do use like postpaid kind of connection but people do prefer using prepaid because it's very cheap you can just get like a prepaid connection for like a maybe like half a dollar and like uh, there is validity for lifetime so like even if you don't have balance in your card you can just receive the calls even though you don't pay the cellular operator a rupees even for your lifetime so there is a problem about the interoperability of value services like if I transfer the MMS if I want to share a picture or the video, video clip what happens is like I send the video clip and it doesn't reach my friend because what happens is like I'm using the Airtel connection or maybe he's using some other company connection. What happens is his MMS feature is not working or maybe like his operator doesn't allow MMS feature with his services. So what happens if I send the MMS, I do get charged for like 5 rupees or 10 rupees but still uh, my information is not getting processed so like unnecessarily I'm being charged. I mean, even if the transaction is not complete, I have been charged. Then there were several other consulting work which came about like especially related to some regional kind of complaints, especially in terms of 
complaints in Mumbai region where there was no good amount of reception, no good amount of services, and then there was a problem with billing cycles. There are some other problems even which like uh, you can uh, like focus on like uh, what happens is if I use a postpaid kind of connection, even if I use it for 200 rupees tomorrow, if I get a bill for like by mistake for 300 rupees, on 300 rupees I have been, I'm charged for some tax or educational sales. So if I go to a company and I say like uh, no, I have used it for 200 rupees, not 300 rupees. You should refund my hundred rupees back. What they should do is like you refund your hundred rupees back plus the extra tax that has been charged on hundred rupees. But it has happened with myself only like uh, they just returned my money. They just didn't just return the tax that was like uh, put on the extra amount of money they charged me. So what happened was like uh, I was charged for like around four thousand extra. I just got the money back, but around like 450 rupees I had to lose. I mean, that's not my fault. Plus, like my connection was not working for 15 to 20 days. So many times it happens, like if I'm using a cell phone, value added services just get on. I mean, uh, at night I just receive a joke or maybe like a news alert. I don't know if it's charged or not because at the end of the SMS, there is nothing mentioned like this service has been charged or anything. Maybe like after 15 days you will come to know like uh, you get a SMS like uh, this kind of your account or sports news alerts have been reactivated and you have been charged for 30 rupees for 30 days and when you come to know like this is something fishy going on with your phone, mobile phone account, you call your customer service, what they do is like uh, okay so this is the problem with you, okay we'll do one thing, we'll just uh, refund your money back but what I mean if I had just 30 rupees and like uh, they took out the 30 rupees from my account, I wasn't you. I mean, I was not able to call anybody for like two days or three days or maybe like even couple of hours when I I was in need of calling somebody very urgently. So like on that issue, there are no regulations. What uh, telecom regulatory authority says like when you provide value added service, if a consumer subscribes for the value added service, what you should do is get a consent, get a return and like document <coughs> consent where it, it, I mean, <coughs> where there should be mention of uh, the subscriber's name plus subscriber's phone number, what time he subscribed and where, for which service or for which service code he subscribed. But so many times it happens like so many kinds of value data service just get on, I mean, you never know like it's like operating in the background of your cell phone, you just, you're, you just go on getting SMSs, one day you realize, okay, this has been charged and this is not been charged. And you call the customer service. So many times, even if it, it happens like, customer care service people, they are not ready to understand what has happened with your account. And like for weeks or like couple of, like eight days to couple of weeks, you just lose the money and just in the hope of getting that money back, you just keep on like calling them, Plus, and sometimes you don't get the money at all. I mean, many a times happens like if a, per, if a person from United States goes to India, he uses his cell phone, loses 30 rupees, he has to return in a couple of days. This is not going to take so many efforts to like uh, call them 10 times and like just ask him, nah, please return my 30 rupees. It's not going to happen. He just comes back to United States. And what happens is like the telecom providers, they do get the money out of them. And what happens is like, from the value added services these cellular operators provide, chunk, big chunk of money goes to the actual cellular carrier. So actually those are the people who are getting benefited, not actually the people who are like uh, content aggregators or content providers, or actual innovation providers. So, there are various challenges for the growth of value-added services in India. What are, what the main challenge is like, whatever value-added services those are like available in India, it's basically focused on youth and entertainment. That's because every company, I mean, which launches their cellular services in India, they always focus on youth. That's like college crowd and university going people because they are the people who are ready to like uh, change the SIM card just for the minor like a benefit like if I'm get, getting 100 SMS free of charge for like a month subscription for like 20 rupees, 
I will just throw my uh, like a cellular SIM card from a cellular operator called A to like uh, switch it to like cellular operator B. I mean that's like uh, that's what companies do and that has been happening so far. What companies do is like when they do the product launch, they just get a subscriber base. But government does not like uh, look on the things like uh, if you have this around like a 50 million subscriber base, how many of them are actively using those connections? And if like there are so many people who do have like 10 connections, 10 prepaid connection, they are not using even single connection out of it. So what happens is they just make their subscriber base, they make it big, and that's how they get tax rebates, then some policy. <coughs> soft corners from the government because you have substantial amount of users with you so we are giving some tax rebate and some soft policies for you then there is a huge issue with the piracy of content there is like a, if you download some movie in the United States it's like illegal you, next day you get a mail from AT&T or your internet service provider like this stuff you are downloaded it's illegal so you will be charged for this or maybe like please don't do this honey. But there is nothing in like that in India. There is a whole lot of lack of infrastructure. Then people still today prefer low cost handset and like low feature handset because the average amount of income that one person has is far below like somebody in developed countries. Plus the cost of the handset that is that goes so fast down like uh, if you buy a handset for 20,000 bucks in January of the year by the end of December the cost of the handset will be somewhere close to like 3,000 or 4,000 so that is kind of a handset market issue so then there is absence of utility services there is validated services are very heavily caught like uh, they are very high cost, then there is no transparency in the revenue sharing that is still lacking because even if I like a download a wallpaper from like a Manchester United portal from Airtel, I don't know like uh, if my 10 rupees are how like how those 10 rupees are going to be spent. I will what I will probably do is just go to Google, just get a free email from Manchester United, use it as a wallpaper screen server. Then there is whole lot of issues with spam and like connectivity problems. The connectivity is the main problem. It's very slow. I mean, even if you use a 3G kind of a connectivity, you will hardly like um, get a good connection where you can see the live streaming of YouTube videos or so. But there is also a brighter side of the world where <coughs> like, uh, music and messaging around message it makes around like a one billion dollars for the operators then there are so many cloud applications those are coming up and like that because this platform is in the nascent stage there is like a huge amount of <coughs> growth area available for their survival then advertisement on this on this platform is in very like a primitive stage so not so many people are like a, on the on this platform not so many people have realized the potential of this platform. So like uh, people who really want to get into mobile marketing business, they have huge growth potential. And like, uh, as I said, like after 2010, so many global companies are like going to come to Indian area. Like uh, what ha will happen is like uh, because of the entry of more and more global telecom players, the competition will increase and like uh, consumers will get cheap services and better quality of the services. So like uh, as I already mentioned, like there are issues with the consumer which are like related to mobile billing, then there are like unnecessary charges for that validated services, then poor connectivity, and their charges application even after failure to process it. Like if I send a MMS, it's not gone still and charge. Then service part even after payment. If I like uh, uh, activate my MMS services for like by paying like twenty five to thirty rupees of it, it's like half a dollar or one dollar. Uh, what I will get SMS like uh, these services on your handset have been activated but if I use those services, those services are not just working. I mean if I call the customer service they will say oh that's running on your cell phone I can't see any problem from here.
so that is like a loss for the consumer. I mean, he's in dilemma. Like, what should I do? He's saying like it's working. I, I don't know about anything. So like, <laughs> so that's again a part of poor customer service. Even I guess uh, poor customer service is on the like a part of a provider, and maybe on the I mean, you can say five to ten percent it <coughs> on the part of user because. The educational level of people who are like using the cell phone today in India, and on an average, they are like uh, I would say like 30 percent of less than that of them are like graduated and like really know like, like English and all this because not all the people in India do learn English in their schools. What basically people learn English is like in the higher grades. So like, uh, what is mobile health? So it's basically like uh, using your health application on your cell phone or your mobile and like uh, helping, like uh, providing accessibility for the users who can like reach the healthcare facilities. So like, uh, what are the problems we have so far seen? I mean, a child born in developing country is over like 30, three times more vulnerable to die within the first five years of life. That's in like really bad in terms of any developed country. So every minute at least one woman dies from the complication related to pregnancy or childbirth. Then around 2.5 million people newly get, I mean 2.5 million amount of people, those get infected with HIV. That's like a huge number of population. Then this is just uh, like a tuberculosis or like malaria, which are like supposed to be like a in control, but still they are causing a whole lot of calamity in these kinds of regions, especially like Africa and like India. Still today they are like a fatal disease. Even though like a government says like a, it's under control. So and most of the emerging economies where it's like a short of shortage of healthcare workers. That's because we don't have enough kind of educational institutes with, with us where we can like uh, train the people. Then there is like a lack of amount of funding with the people. Like not everybody can like uh, afford to go into some medical school or maybe nursing school and learn the skills. Plus the people who learn these skills or like in person like who's a doctor and they are not so much keen upon like uh, serving the rural population because they don't get so much of money out, out there plus the living like status gets like compromised if you stay in the rural area but if you stay in urban area you get a whole lot of money so the one important point in case of mobile health for these kinds of emerging economies like mobile has a deeper reach within these countries than any kind of technology because what you can see is like people who don't even know about like computer or don't even know about bikes even there are so many people who don't know about bikes they are using cell phones and they are using cell phones to the like great extent I mean they, are, they can send SMS they can send MMS they know everything about the cell phone but they don't know about the other technology so, like a United Nations has <coughs> a millennium development goal, so three of them are enlisted over here. So, fourth one is like a reduced child mortality, reduce it by two thirds between 1990 and 2050, and uh, under five mortality rates. The fifth one is uh, improve maternal health, reduce by three quarters between 1990 to 2050, the maternal mortality ratio. And the sixth one is combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other have been halted by 2015 and like begun to reverse the spread of HIV. But it's simply not happening, it's just spreading. It's not been halted anyway. So what mobile health or e-health can simply do for the people who are staying in these areas? So it's like a, you can run an awareness campaign by sending out SMSs or sending out the like a small MMS to people who are using the cell phones and like uh, ask them to like uh, we are hosting a, a thing over here where you can 
comment like I vaccinated for free and so like uh, there are people who do like uh, get promoted by this and they do come to center and get the vaccination done so that is a kind of vaccination snap and this is like uh, uh, I have a friend whose name is Sameer Shavaka who has a company called Neurosynaptics I mean he runs this company and what they make make is this uh, system where you can like uh, this is a small system which runs on low voltage as well as and uh, it has a video conference system which come, uh, like uh, runs on around like 32 kbps of connection I mean, that's like a very bad kind of gprs connection even so like even in that kind of connectivity you can consult with the doctor remotely and like uh, the doctor can help you to like uh, diagnose the patient i mean these kinds of systems you can just put in rural areas with the local chemist or maybe like in school where like a skilled person who can at least just use the system is available people can come to that center they can just ask the person who's sitting over there like i need some treatment or i need a diagnosis and just that fellow can like uh, assist him to like get a better healthcare service and the person who's sitting in like a city he can just diagnose 100 patients by sitting in the city room you don't need to like uh, come to a village actually so what e-health can provide is like a uh, education training i can just uh, train the nurses or like uh, people who have been like uh, traditionally been like a uh, kind of healthcare workers in the village i can just train them to like uh, provide better services just train them with the basic medical uh, medicines like just what are the uh, like first aid kind of things then these kinds of tools can be used for diagnosis and treatment for disease tracking if like uh, Google Health is there which tracks like a spread of influenza and other diseases when you get the numbers so like you can just be ready to face I mean even if you are a doctor you can just keep a track of things like if you need some knowledge refreshment and all then you can just remotely monitor the patients as like, like a, you can see over here like a, the nurse is like applying the ECG leads and like you can get the ECG done at this place and the ECG gets transferred to the hospital which is like 500 kilometers away and you can just do remote consulting so like uh, who are the people who can get a piece of cake through this mobile phone there are people who are like a major patient and like a <coughs> mobile subscriber they will get a better health service then there is healthcare providers like hospitals or maybe health <coughs> insurance providers who will like a uh, able to like uh, provide efficient and quality amount health services then there are NGOs who can promote their organizational mission and like uh, get more and more funding just promote themselves and like do the marketing for that so then there are government who can just like uh, uh, provide the better access to their healthcare and like uh, it, it can also help for effective governance of the health policies. Then there are medical device companies which, which can like by using this online portal or like a mobile health app application platform they can provide the same kind of services and like uh, generate the revenue for themselves. Then there are platform provider companies they too can like generate revenue for themselves. Then there are content aggregators and there are mobile health application providers. They can just get the money for licenses and the kind of information they are providing. So, what are the patient and or user concern for e-health or mobile health? Why patients are so much scared about using like electronic medical records or like uh, using mobile health application? Main issue is like security issue. What happens is like if I'm using an electronic medical record, my data is getting like uh, it's been put into a particular kind of server which the company I mean the server belongs to the company which is providing the EMR to me so I simply do not know like if I need to go to some other doctor I need to share the same data with him if I'll be able to share the same kind of data with him or not and if I share that I mean if I'm able to share the data with him it can happen like uh, somebody else can just have a look at my health information and like may cause some problem to, my, to me in the future <coughs> then the main thing like uh, what this course has been taught for like role of policy
policy makers in this mobile health and like mobile users. What they can do is like uh, make this mobile health platform as an integral part of the national health care system or as an integral part of the health policies those are provided and make make it a basic thing so that everybody who needs uh, like a health care, he has access to these things. He can get a better access even if it's located remotely. Then by putting uh, these things in the memorandum for the uh, national health policy, they can ensure like uh, the project sustainability and the impact of the projects those are done so that the investors those are coming up to invest in these kinds of technology, they will be sure like Okay, there is some future to these technologies. The government is also like uh, promoting these technologies, so we can invest the money into this technology. Then, providing mobile health application as a part of nationwide health system. Then, uh, encouraging the providers of application services and content by incentivizing their efforts. Because unless you incentivize companies which are actually providing the platform, which are actually providing the solution, which are applicable actually providing the content, I mean nobody is going to take effort to like just make the revenue out of license because the license is not so costly and the money is not actually coming up. What we need is there is some incentive like tax rebate if I am like uh, spending some amount of money to build the application there should be a tax rebate so that I can get the money out of the market and so on. Then providing grants and funding to the research center and university so that there can be more amount of research can be done on these issues and like there will be more um, better kind of application come up in the market and like people just can get help from this application and be safe and better. And so, uh, this was my presentation. Thank you very much. India is better developed than African nations. I mean, yeah. I mean, still, the Indian authorities in nascent stage, they do not have like a whole kind of powers and like whole kind of research data with them on the basis of which they can just go ahead and like, and like frame the policy. So you need to deal with all the like uh, things with related to like regulatory as well as financials and all those things. So unless you deal with all these issues at one time, they cannot go for and the regulatory body is federal, not state. I'm, I know, I'm not sure how India's, reg India's regulatory body is. It's federal. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of autonomous body, but it's by government. So okay. it's kind of federal too. Do you have anything? I know people's concerns are about the security of the so good kind of connectivity or internet connectivity right now. So like there are very few kind or like a few amount of people those are actually using this application. And even if those people are using this application, what happens is like they really don't know like where my data is actually going because I mean the copyright problems or maybe like security things are not so strict in Indian scenarios. So like even if somebody hacks into server and gets your data I mean, people are not so much confident about these applications because they are not promoted by government or the people or like agencies like uh, which are like credible enough to be like believed. Yeah. So you're a doctor yourself, and you were you seem to have been professing the idea of mobile health quite a bit, but it's just a little difficult for me to understand diagnosing someone like a disease. 
idea of event conferencing. It's just like, how do you make sure that the tools that are being used for <coughs> are, you know, safe and sort of sterilized or whatever? No. Just See, like, uh, I'm not saying, like, I'm going to diagnose a cardiovascular disease sitting in the Mumbai and, like, uh, the patient is, like, 1,000 kilometers away from me. That's, like, a little difficult. But mm -hmm. that's also possible because uh, if you can see, This machine, I mean, it has kind of a diagnostic, like a parameters with it, which are like a ECG, plus it has a spirometer, it has a pulse oximeter, it has all kind of diagnostic parameters you need if you are in the hospital, you need it, a remote, like a unit of care. So, what I can do is like a, run these parameters, get the initial amount of information that is related to patient health. Like, if you are a patient who just has a dandruff, you don't need to come to a city hospital or maybe you are just having a chest pain. Maybe that's not because of a like a cardiovascular pain, that's just because of some kind of acidity or gases. So I can at least I can contribute this much. I mean if there are hundred patients in the village, not everybody will have a severe problem. Like five or ten of them may have some complicated or severe problem. So I can ask those five or ten people to like come to some primary health care center, get the checkups done. Then again, if they need, they can come to a bigger hospital in the city. But if I ask all the hundred people to come to city, it's a lot of money spent in transportation, plus not everybody know how to go to that health care center. Not, there are not so many doctors to treat all these hundred patients at one time. But there are doctors who are sitting in the city or maybe like some other location I treat like a 20 patients a day, but sometimes I do, don't have patients. So in that time I can just serve the patients. I'm serving that's like a dirt cheap, like five rupees per patient. And if I ask that patient to come to my clinic, I'll be charging somewhere around 500 rupees. So that way it works. There is like a whole like a entire value chain behind like a backdrop of this valued service. Like a, there are people who like provide the content. There are people who like process that content. There are people like who provide the platform. There is a cellular operator which provides each service. I mean, all kinds of value added services in India are provided through a cellular operator. It's not like United States where you can get the value added services from anybody else, you don't need to like uh, collaborate with the cellular operator. So there it's like, uh, there is a regulated problem because you cannot just ask those 10 people to like get a license for providing these kinds of service and, and unless and until they do have a license, it's not like uh, imperative for the government to like, uh, like uh, inspect their quality of service and all those things because they are not like, uh, abiding by the rules of government, they don't have any license, they don't have any registry. They are just doing it because they do have the content and they can do it. And the cellular, it's going through the cellular operator. 